to Conservation Conversation with me, Kaz. Richard Pierce is a wildlife conservationist, author and producer, developing conservation projects for sharks, rhinos and elephants in Africa and the United Kingdom. African megafauna has been a lifelong passion for Richard and in recent years many of his books and films have raised awareness of the plight of rhinos, elephants, lions, pangolins and others. In the middle of 2018, work started on an investigative documentary film called Lions, Bones and Bullets. As part of the investigation, Richard spent time in Southeast Asia to understand the lion carcass journey once it has left South African shores. He shares a very disturbing experience with us. We also hear Richard's controversial opinion on how the lion farm trade in South Africa could potentially be brought to an end. Welcome, Mr. Richard Pierce. Thank you for taking time to have a conversation with me. Not at all. It's good to be, good, good to be here. One of the aspects of your conservation work that has come to my attention in, in getting ready to have a chat with you is that you're quite specific about the conservation of, of African wildlife. Can you share your thoughts um, and your opinion about why African wildlife is significant in the conservation chain? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I think if you say wildlife to people all over the planet, it's highly likely the image that will come to most minds is going to be one of the uh, iconic African species. Uh, it'll be a giraffe, it'll be a, a lion, it'll be a hippo, it'll be a rhino, it'll, it'll be a leopard or, or, you know, something like that. Uh, and so I think kind of on a symbolic level, if we lose the fight to preserve Africa's iconic species, we probably lost the fight to preserve the world uh, in terms of na natural things. Um, and so that's why I picked it, apart from the fact that these are amazing animals, uh, you know, I'm yeah. in love with them all and blah, 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 and that, et cetera. But I, I truly believe that we've got to save the icons, because if we lose the icons, and, and a terrifying specter to me is that Africa's wildlife will end up still being kind of wild, but in like lots of Jurassic Park type setups all over the place, dotted around. So you'll be able to go to relatively small private reserves and you'll still be able to see these animals. But, but is it real wild? You know, what, what's happened to the wilderness areas of the continent that we so desperately need? So that's why uh, Africa wildlife. Okay. And I think there's one, there's one species that sort of kicked off your, your series of books that you've written the first, the first book was called The Poacher's Moon and dealt with rhinos. That's right. That, that was the first in a series of six, which was rhinos to elephants, back to sharks, to orcas, to lions with Cuddle Me, Kill Me, yes. and then to pangolins. Um, so, and what triggered that was, is, is I came across the, the case of two particular rhinos that had been particularly brutally poached and they'd had their horns chopped right out of their faces, uh, right into their nasal uh, sinuses. Um, and they were called Higgins and Lady. Uh, and, and the fact they were called Higgins and Lady, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> I thought was really rather cool. Um, uh, and they survived. And what a battle for the survival they had. So I decided to use them as a sort of communications tool to try and take the horrors of rhino poaching to, to, to as broad a public as possible. Cuddle Me, Kill Me followed about four years later. And, and the problem with Cuddle Me, Kill Me was I didn't know how to do it. Um, I, I try and get real animal stories about existent true animals uh, and tell an, adventure, tell an adventure story about them and try and make it an adventure story because I don't believe there's any point in preaching to the converted. Uh, so I want to, to get the guys who are passing casually through the airport, through the bookshop, through the curio shops, through through Addo, through the Kruger, through Kalahadi, blah, blah, blah. And those are the, these are the guys, ca casual guys. Uh, and so I try and snare them with an exciting real life sort of wildlife adventure story. And I didn't know how to do it with Cuddle Me, Kill Me until I came across two lions uh, that have been rescued from the, the whole breeding scene. 
uh, and, and I came across these two lions and in discovering what had happened to them, I thought, hey, you know, this is this is this has just got to be investigated. I mean, you know, I wasn't the first one, of course, but I needed to know what was going on. Okay. And I think um that kind of planted a virtual seed with you as far as understanding not just the two lines that you you uh met through that particular book, but later wanting to have an understanding of of what the end of the lion carcass journey meant can you share with us your uh what you uncovered during your time in southeast asia in trying to understand this life cycle of the lion carcass death cycle perhaps yes um y yes uh, absolutely i mean once um the the uh, canned hunting had taken a big hit due to the Americans banning, um, you know, trophies from canned hunting. Um, one of the things that, that the breeders did was look for alternative revenue sources. Uh, and and the, the, the uh, lion skeleton thing was already there, but, but that they could expand on it. Um, and so we wanted to find the other end of the South African skeleton chain, which meant Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and ultimately with the products, China all based on the fact that you can't tell a, a lion skeleton from a tiger skeleton. So the skeleton goes over there uh, and it, it gets used in the preparation of tiger products, which are actually lion, but, but, but you know, who knows? So, you know, the public's being conned at every level. Not only are they being conned that tiger wine will, will give you a bigger penis or something, but they're also being conned, it's the wrong bloody animal. You know, so it's pretty horrendous stuff. But what, it, I was utterly shocked because uh, you will have heard of CITES, and maybe a lot of your listeners have heard of CITES. Um, the countries we visited are all CITES signatories. So they know they're not supposed to be trading in, in Appendix 1, Appendix 2 species. And I was finding ivory, I was finding pangolins, I was finding tiger products quite openly. I didn't have to sort of go in and sort of rub my nose or make a secret sign or something like that. I was wandering into shops, you could do the same thing, like, like a tourist, that's what we were masquerading as being. Um, and if I can do it, so can the police. And so here were these countries flagrantly flogging all this stuff that they'd signed up to control and not to flog. And, and that was the most important lesson I learned there. Um, and it, it was pretty, pretty scary stuff. I, I mean, one of the things that really hit me, I went to a restaurant, which I've been tipped off about, uh, and I was told they sold pangolin amongst other things. So I went and asked what they had, and, and, and I said, I, you might have some wild meat. I thought that would, might be sort of unlock the secrets. Uh, I really didn't need to do that. But immediately I was offered civet. Civet is the probable vector, as I'm sure you know, for SARS-1 back in 2002-2003. Never been 100% accepted by science, but I think most people think it was the vector. So I was offered that within minutes. And then I said, well, no, that's not really terribly exciting. You know, I've had that before, you know, something a bit different, you know, and then immediately pangolin. And, and, and within a few months, pangolin was being talked about as the vector for COVID SARS-2, COVID-19. But, but it was just, just, you know, no, no, or totally brazen. And I was offered, I was offered the flesh. Uh, I can't remember how much without looking it up. And, and when I hummed and hard, they obviously thought I was negotiating. Uh, because they then they then said, well, we'll bring the animal to your table and kill it, basically, so you can be sure that your money is buying what you think it's buying. And, and so the whole experience was an extraordinary experience. And but it was the brazenness of the trading, I think, that that that, that hit me hardest. And we found the other end of South Africa's lion skeleton trail. We visited loads of places where. Uh, permits, export permits, import permits have been issued. You go to those addresses, they don't exist. Or it's a freight forwarding outfit. So you go to there, but you don't know who the client is. And the client behind these people are the tiger farms. You know, they're importing the lion skeletons into the tiger farms, but it's actually cheaper, quicker to buy tiger lion skeletons than it is to grow full-size tigers. So, so yeah, it, it was a pretty exciting and pretty depressing journey in many ways. I'm sure. But Chris, just um, maybe an opinion from, from you in this regard, as you've pointed out, these countries are site signatories and, you know, it's obviously from your experience, pretty easy to, to get, 
to the point where the evidence is right there in front of you and, and investigations can be launched and arrests can be made and prosecutions done. And what do you think the, the holdback is in these countries to actually do that and go through that process in order to, to just kill the trade? What do you mean? What, why it's going on in the way it is going on? Yes. Um, I, I don't think there's a single reason. I, I, you've got corruption. You've got inefficient policing. Uh, you, you've got really a lack of will as well. They may have signed up to it, but things like traditional Chinese medicine are extremely potent parts of their culture, irrespective of whether a lot of these products do any good or not. Um, and most of the animal products probably don't, but a lot of the plant products actually do. So you're fighting a whole load of, of, of things, but it can be done, I believe. And, and one of the reasons I think that, that it, it should be able to be done is that if you go to the biggest consumer on the planet, which is China, you know, you can't go there today. I think, you know, we're all in trouble. It's pretty isolated, et cetera. But in theory, they can do things that other countries can't. It's a state controlled system. So if the Chinese government decided to put their mind to it, they control all the media, they control the TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and that they could change people's minds pretty quickly. Yeah. So I think we can, we can deduce from that that they haven't really put their minds to it. There isn't really, it's not on their agenda. I, yes, I agree. And I think that certainly plays um, into the backstory of um, the uptick of rhino poaching that we saw from... 2011 12 onwards where a certain asian leader was diagnosed with cancer and he made the declaration that ingesting rhino horn saved him from terminal cancer um, and i think yeah ever since then it's just been year after year after year the numbers of our species being decimated for that very reason. So I agree. I think definitely if, if someone were to put their mind to it, they could actually do something about it. Well, you know, that, that particular guy, uh, you know, um, uh, that we're talking about, um, did a, a, a massive amount of harm. But, but, but that's also moved on because rhino horns now become just as much of a status symbol. Yes. In terms of ownership of a thing, you know, ornament on your table, a bracelet or something or other. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's part of the whole status thing if you're a young Vietnamese. I mean, they're, they're the big consumers, really. You know, we can do without that sort of thing. But I just quote you a really quick example of, of how things can be changed. Um, there's a chef in Britain, a guy called Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, and he went over to China some years ago um, and he was, he was uh, trying to do something about ivory. I can't remember which city it is in China that, where they carve an awful lot of ivory. And he went there and conducted, for want of a better expression, a kind of awareness campaign. He must have been working with the government because he was able to put up hoardings and things and, and, and you know, uh, big, big sort of cinema things in, in, in metros and stuff. When people started to realize what was involved in the ivory they were wearing, it had come from an animal, a threatened animal, there was a lot of pain involved, a lot of blood involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The consumption went right down. So it can be done. Uh, awareness is, I believe, you know, a, a massive tool because once they've learned about that, you don't unlearn that. Yes. And, and, and the same thing with shark fins. You know, once the young turned away from shark fins and the Chinese government banned shark fins at consumption at, uh, you know, government banquets and things, we saw that that start to reduce. So look, it, it's not mission impossible. As you say, it just takes the right mindset and a concerted effort, not just on one part of the globe, but around the globe, hey? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, th th this, is, this, this is all part of a huge criminal uh, enterprise. Uh, and so there's no point in, you know, you can't have a supply without a demand, you can't have a demand without a supply, blah, 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 blah. One increases, the other increases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a sort of handle one end or the other. You've got to hit both ends and everything in the middle. Yes. So, you know, absolutely. Yeah. It needs yeah. global effort. Mm. For sure. So, Richard, given these outcomes from your time um, spent in Southeast Asia, and I have not, being in South Africa, I've not yet had the chance to watch your movie Lines, Bones, and, and Bullets, but it's my understanding that your time in Southeast Asia lent to, to the, the production of this movie. Is that correct? No. Um, the, the, the book... Uh, was first cuddle me kill me yes and then and then the movie kind of grew out of the book 
And then as part of the movie, we wanted to go to the other end uh, of, of the consumption, you know, where, where, where the skeletons were going to end up. So, so that was the chain. Okay. And, and so that's what the movie speaks to is the other end of the, of the supply chain. Not only, I mean, I, th I think what it does is, is it speaks to the fact that lions, lion breeding is, is not one particular consumptive exploitation. It's a whole bunch. You know, I mean, uh, as we all know, they're exploited from cubs, you know, uh, uh, voluntourism, through petting, through walking with them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they end up one way or another with a bullet. Um, and so we try to explore all the various facets. The one we probably spent least time on was the hunting one, actually. Um, so we tried to explore all of them, but, uh, but definitely the bones was probably the major one that we concentrated on. Um, yeah. Can we speak about Minister of Fisheries, Forestries and Environment, Barbara Creasy, specifically her draft white paper, wherein there were recommendations made of a voluntary exit offer being given to lion farms around South Africa. The draft paper was made available for public comment. The deadline was for the 8th of September. And I think it was since extended to the 26th of September. Yes. yes. Today is the 18th of October. Do you know of anything that's happened between the 26th of September and the 18th of October? Are we getting anywhere? The answer is no, I don't. But I mean, it, that's not a big passage of time. I would hope that they've collated everything they've collected. Uh, and, and we're now, you know, moving towards the next phase. Okay. And, and what do you think the next phase should look like? I'd rather look at that in a different way. Okay. I'd rather look at that in terms of, in terms of uh, heading, get, getting ready to head off what I see as the big threat. Um, what these guys are doing is perfectly legal. Indeed, you could argue that it had been encouraged by the government who changed the law and they'd changed uh, lions into cows, legally speaking, effectively. Uh, they'd applied to CITES for export permits for skeletons. So in a way, it's, a, it's a, almost like a government sponsored uh, industry. So I, I think I'd like to look ahead to what happens when uh, Minister Creasy's uh, things go further down the track and the inevitable legal challenges come, which have derailed this whole thing before. Um, it seems to me that um, one of the things that strengthens the legal case uh, for people claiming is that if they've been conducting a perfectly legal activity and then it's sort of next week on Tuesday made illegal, you've devalued their stock, you've taken away their living, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we take the emotion out of it and just concentrate on the pragmatism, it would seem to me we need to head off these legal challenges by acknowledging that somehow they have to be, and the word, everybody hates it, but, but they have to be compensated somehow. And, and, and I know it's unpalatable. Uh, my friends in animal welfare tell me it's completely wrong to, to, to reward this ghastly thing they've been doing for years. Of course it is wrong to reward it, but do we still want to be having this conversation in five years time? Because gosh, you know, it first came into the public uh, daylight, when was it, 1997 with the Roger Cook report? Uh, my mathematics is pretty crap, but what's that? 25 years. And we've actually gone backwards in terms of the numbers of lions that existed then and now in, in captivity being bred. So I think that we need to have a sort of consensus amongst, um, if you call it our side of the fence, uh, and we need to not, not oppose the idea of, of somehow compensation being given. Because otherwise we're giving them an open goal to shoot at. Their lawyers will just come along and say, you know, what about my client's legal claims? Why give them that gift to start with? Let's take it away. 100%. And by the sounds of it, um, your opinion is that we need to be drawing that line in the sand sooner rather than later. I think we need to be talking about it. And I think, you know, one thing we can be sure of is, is that on the lion breeding side, they will probably be united. You know, they've got one aim, and that's to retain lion breeding. Uh, on the other side of the fence, you've got animal welfareists, you've got conservationists, you've got lion ecologists, you've got da 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 and an awful lot of the time that they, they don't agree. And even amongst the NGO community, they don't agree. So I think I think there's no point uh, in sort of faction fighting. 
uh, infighting. But what we really must do, I think, is acknowledge um, that uh, that this has to be part of the discussion and, and that it must not be torpedoed at the end because of this. That, that's what really frightens me. And mm. I was talking to a leading guy in a global NGO the other day who absolutely vetoed the idea of trading the skeletons out. Well, I do understand that because if you if you push uh, if you push supply into a, a situation, you're going to increase demand. We've seen that with ivory. We've seen it with lots of things. Um, so yes, there are. It's a multifaceted sort of discussion that we need to have. But I think the principle has got to be that we must take away them, giving them a legal a legal open goal. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Okay. So just to clarify, I understand that lion farming was legalized in the same way that we farm with cows and chickens and pigs and things. Can I just understand, is there legislation in place that looks to the welfare of these of these lions or is there not? Do you know? Uh, as I understand it, there's certainly no effective legislation. I mean, the poor old NSPCA are the only people who, who sort of get involved. And, and, and you know, um, I think they're sort of understaffed, underfunded, and, and they'd love to be able to do an awful lot more. And then you've got funny anomalies like, like tigers. Because they're not an indigenous species, there's no legislation governing them at all because they don't exist. So, no, I, th I think the broad answer is no. I mean, I'm quite sure... Uh, there may well be bits of legislation here and there, but it ain't working. It doesn't seem to be very enforceable. Uh, the NSPCA can go and they can confiscate, and they can do various things. Um, but certainly the animal welfare aspect has got to be one of the big things of any phase out situation. Because first thing you need to do is visit all the farms, conduct an audit of how many animals, see how healthy, see which ones need to be euthanized, have a total you know, audit of the whole situation. Uh, that would be the first thing. And then making sure the animals that didn't need to be euthanized were kept healthy and happy, as healthy and happy as possible, would have to be part of the phase out. Yes. OK. Who do you think would foot the bill to, to make sure that the remaining lions from these breeding facilities are kept happy and healthy, obviously, until the their end of life in a natural as natural sort of environment as what's what's possible where would you where would you see the funds for that exercise coming from a certain amount certainly can be raised around the world uh, and a lot of effort can be raised around the world um, I mean I was talking to Peter Colwell the vet uh, when we were making the film about three years ago he pointed out to me that every year all over the world, there are loads and loads and loads of newly qualified young vets who would jump at the chance if their airfare was paid and their food and board was paid to come and work free in South Africa for three months for the, um, the experience. So you could probably have a whole volunteer uh, bunch of vets turning over for six months or something to help with this process under the supervision of, of people like Dr. Peter. So that kind of cost, I think, can be a lot less than it might otherwise be. And, and the, you know, the enthusiastic man, international manpower would be waiting. But there's very few facilities uh, and we've got nothing like the amount of places we need to take care of thousands of lions. Doesn't matter which way you cut it. Let, let's just say it's, take a figure, let's just say it's 12,000, 10,000, knock it down a bit. Um, and, then, and then you have to euthanize, let's say, 2,000. These are totally arbitrary figures. I, they're coming off the top of my head. You've still got 8,000. Let's say you've only got half that. It's 4,000. Where do you put 4,000 lions? Who looks after them? Who pays for them? Yeah. I mean, at the, mo at the moment, you know, a lot of these places are sited next to chicken factories and, and, and large cattle ranches so they can serve as dead stock disposal units. Yes. Um, but it's not, not a very desirable d diet, you know, and, and uh, some of those chickens are fed stuff they shouldn't be being fed anyway on the way to the poor old lion. So, it, look, it's pretty complex and it's not going to be cheap. No, I, I hear you. So, Richard, it sounds like Barbara's got her hands full and she's got many angles to, to look at and I'm sure lots of opinions being thrown at her. But for right now... I'm pleased that she has your support and it has been very interesting getting some insight from you. So thank you very much for spending the time. 
we tried to approach the making of lions, bones and bullets as a neutral piece of investigative journalism. Uh, and it was difficult because uh, we all knew what was going on. If we've succeeded, and I don't think we've wholly succeeded, but we've succeeded to a degree, I think it could be quite a powerful tool for Minister Creasy to have uh, in, in her briefcase, because it, it is a pretty neutral piece of work, uh, and it's all absolutely true. There's nothing invented. It's all what has happened, is happening, et cetera, et cetera. So I just hope that our film can contribute towards shining a light onto this whole thing. And, and helping the process. Well, thank you. And I'm very excited to have an opportunity to watch it. And maybe once I have done, I've got a little bit more inside of my own and, and you and I can meet again and continue the conversation. That would be fun. I'd love that. All right, Richard, we have run out of time. Thank you very, very much for, for joining me. And I look forward to having another conservation conversation with you. Cool. You keep well. If you would like to learn more about Richard Pierce, his books and films, please see the link in the description. Thanks for taking the time to listen. We hope you'll join us in our next conservation conversation. Just a quick shout out to the original music shop, also known as Tom's, for assisting us with our podcasting equipment. You guys are awesome! <coughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>